Hi, this is Bob Sorrentino from Italian Moots and Genealogy, and I'm here today with a very special guest from New York City, uh, Linda Stasi, and she is the author of several books, including The Book of Judas and The Sixth Station, and also a daily news columnist. So welcome, Linda. Thanks for being here. Thank you. Very nice to be here. Uh, yeah, it's great to finally meet. We've been exchanging emails for so long. Uh, so, you know, first, I want to talk about your books a little later on, uh, but first I'd like to ask you about your Italian roots, uh, where they come from, you know, have you gone back and visited and things like that? Well, um, my grandfather on, and grandmother on my mother's side were from um, Sicily and my grandfather and grandmother on my father's side were from Calabria. So, you know, they say hard heads and violence. <laughs> so I always say, uh, my, my, my joke is, uh, don't piss me off because I'll kill you and I'll still be mad. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, my wife is, her, her mom is from Sicily and her, her dad is from Puerto Rico, so. Same. <laughs> Uh, so now, so now um, we've talked a little bit before. You have gone back, and have you gone back to the to the uh, ancestral towns and everything? Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, the interesting one was uh, we went to Belvedere de Spinello in um, uh, Calabria, and I went with my husband. wasn't my husband then, and my daughter, <coughs> and uh, she's fluent in Italian, and I'm shamefully not. We got to this town and everybody, there's all these people dressed in black and they're walking very slowly to a church. And Sid said, that's it, my husband. He said, that's it, they're all vampires. We're leaving here, this is, <laughs> it turns out somebody had died and we walked into, we came in the middle of a funeral and we stayed with my family and uh, that I had never known even existed. But uh, we get to the house and it looks all broken down on the outside and we go inside and it was like a palace. Apparently, they tax you on the outside of your house there, <laughs> so nobody does anything nice on the outside. The inside was like, I mean, I walked into one bathroom, and it was like Madonna couldn't have a bathroom this big. I mean, it was just fantastic. And here's the funny thing. So we went, that they fed us like crazy, and then we went to each relative's house, which is they're all right next door to each other. But for some reason, we, they put us in the car. We drive 10 feet, get out, go to that relative. They feed us, we go to the next one. So I met my little Aunt Rosa, who was made me look tall. I, I made the mistake when she asked me who this man was. I made the mistake of saying my fiance instead of my husband. Oh. So the next morning, I'm at my cousin's house. I hear knock on the door, knock on the door at like six o'clock in the morning. And they had a double door. I opened the top. I don't see anybody. I closed it, went back, and I hear knock, knock, knock. And then I opened it again. I looked down. It was Aunt Rosa. She came to check where I was sleeping and whether <laughs> I had been sleeping with this man. I mean, I never even met the woman before. <laughs> Oh, that's hysterical. Yeah, that's, yeah. that's so funny. And, you know, women in black all dressed in black doesn't phase us Italian-Americans no, because I'm, we're I'm used to that. that. But, but uh, no, this was men in black, women in black, children in black, dogs in black. And they were all marching <laughs> very slowly. It was very scary. Uh, so now, so when you went there, uh, did they know that they had American relatives? Yes, they knew we were coming. We, we managed to connect and they knew we were coming. Uh, yeah, so, and then, you know, everybody tells me the same thing that they just really open up their homes and yeah, their arms and, and they love finding out about us. I mean, uh, like I told you earlier, we were supposed to, uh, I was supposed to meet uh, like 20 third and fourth cousins that I never knew existed up until right. a few years ago. Um, and um, they were, you know, from, from what I gathered, they were just excited as I was to know that they know that they had an American cousin as I was to find out that I actually had, you know, Italian cousins, especially for my, my dad's mom, because I had no idea um, that they were there. Um, and it was funny because the next morning there was one house we didn't get to. So we get in the car and we drive 60 feet <laughs> to this house. <laughs> and this woman answers the door and um, we're talking and, and she speaks Italian and um, I'm in English. And um, it turns out her brother was a NASA scientist, this little tiny town. Really? And this man came in and she was holding a baby 
And a man came in with a, with a, like a doctor's kit. And I said, Oh, is the baby sick? And she said, no. I said, Oh, she said, no, no, he's trying to sell me pharmaceuticals. I said, why? She said, because I'm the doctor. <laughs> <laughs> I just, it was all so surprising to me uh, that this little town had produced a NASA scientist, a female doctor, all kinds of other really, really accomplished, interesting people living in this little mountain town. Is very, it was a great. My Sicily experience, going to see my, that wasn't as, productive. Uh, we took an Italian friend with us the first time every door slammed in our face because I hadn't been able to reach anybody. And the second time we took my, my friend uh, Mario who lives in Italy and he would knock on the on the police office door and say, their family's from here. It's okay. And then everybody <laughs> opened up their doors. <laughs> it was really funny. That's, that is funny. I had a, I had a funny experience in Sorrento. Um, because we were walking through the through the town, and uh, I saw a, a butcher shop, Sorrentino. So, I you know, I was just outside taking a picture just to show everybody at home, hey, there's a Sorrentino butcher shop. And the butcher came out, and he's I don't speak any Italian, unfortunately. I wish I did, but um, I got the drift of he was asking me who I was and where you know why I was taking a, a picture. Uh, so. I took out my license as I said, Sorrentino, America. And he got all excited, Ashbed, Ashbed. And he ran, he just ran away into the, the building next door, the, the store next door. Uh, I came out with somebody who spoke English and he wanted to know all about me and where I was from and where the family was from and, and all of that. Um, and the other fun experience that I had in Sorrento was there was the, I don't know if you've ever been there, but there was uh, right in the middle of town, there's the yes, circle of Sorrentino. Right. And uh, I wanted to go inside and have my photo taken inside and my wife take a picture inside. And the, it was an early Sunday morning and the, the maitre d' or the waiter said, you can't go in. And I said, I'm from, I just want to take a picture inside. My name's Sorrentino. I just want to get a picture. He says, no, you can't go in. So after a couple of minutes of this, he went like this. And there were the four guys with the cigars and the fedoras sitting in the corner. And I said, okay, <laughs> I understand uh, now. <laughs> so, so the Sorrentino means that you're from Sorrento, little, little Sorrento? Uh, initially, yeah, that's, that's what I suspect. I haven't been able to trace any Sorrentinos back to Sorrento, um, but that's pretty much what everybody says. Um, mm -hmm. My uh third great grandparents, Sorrentino, lived in um, Nocera Superiore um, in Campania, not far from, not far from Naples. Uh, so that's as far back as I've been able to go with the Sorrentinos, um, back to there. I think my great grandfather became a lawyer because his wife's parents were lawyers, or his wife's father uh, was a lawyer. Uh, and I haven't been able to confirm this yet. I'm trying. Supposedly, from an obituary I found from the 1920s in New Jersey, I found out that he was a Supreme Court justice wow. in Naples. And I found this from, like I said, from a New Jersey newspaper. Yeah. Uh, so strange how that stuff, you know, all kind of falls together. So you sent me a photo that I thought was amazing. Charlie Carlino. Who was Charlie Carlino? So I'm researching a book now because my mother and her sisters and brothers grew up on a ranch in Colorado, which I thought was really weird and interesting <laughs> considering they're first generation Americans and their parents are from Sicily. Well, it turns out that this town in Colorado where my grandfather had the ranch, Pueblo, almost all the boys from their town ended up living there, moving to Pueblo, Colorado. So at one point in their town in Italy, there was almost 85% of all men under 40 had left and moved to Pueblo. So I found that all very interesting because I'm doing this book, as I said, because my mother and her sisters, there were eight of them. They rode their horses to school. They were wild women. They got in trouble all the time. And my, grand my uncles used to ride in the rodeo and that was a picture I had. 
and my mother had told me about the flood and the, all this other stuff. So I just thought that my, my mother and her sisters would make a great story. And um, my grandfather on my mother's side was a very abusive man. And um, he used to smack my mother around, or tried to, my mother's tougher than me. And um, he used to call her Ruby because she wore red lipstick and he'd catch her wearing red lipstick. So the name of the book is Ruby's Lips. So as I start in, uh, investigating my family and I'm, I'm connecting with a lot of relatives I didn't know I had, including the Carlino family. And turns out my cousin, uh, Charlie Carlino is a restaurateur in um, San Jose, California. And he wrote a book about the Carlinos. In the book, he says, well, your cousin gave me a picture. I said, which cousin? He said, your cousin, Karen. I said, I've asked Karen for pictures. She said she didn't have any. So he sent me the picture of Uncle Charlie Carlino, who looks like the missing person from the, from the village people with his giant <laughs> caps on and everything, and a cowboy hat. Well, it turns out Uncle Charlie Carlino was married to my Aunt Carrie, who was her first husband. I don't know. They must have married her off when she was 14 or something. And when their baby was 10 days old, he was killed in the longest shootout in Colorado history. Wow. So that's my uncle. So, and I, if you ever wonder, this is what I've discovered while researching the book. You ever wonder why Italians were always depicted in all the movies as the bootlegging gangsters of the twenties. And this is the reason it started in Pueblo. When all these guys came to Pueblo, first they came from as miners and then because for Italians, any bit of land is, is king. I mean, mm -hmm. So they all started farming and they were raising, um, what was it called? I forgot, I forgot the, the fruit they were raising. They weren't getting a lot of money from this. So Colorado was the first state in the union to go dry. So they started fermenting these, this, this fruit that they were growing and making hooch. <laughs> and that's how it started. So by the time the rest of the country went dry, these Italians in Colorado had four years on winemaking and liquor making on the rest of the country. So they had the monopoly. So that's how it happened, believe it or not. That's amazing. That's incredible. Isn't that an amazing story? <laughs> that's so funny. That's, a that's how and, it happened. And it makes sense that they went there for mining. I'm sure they probably were sending people over to Italy to find Italian men to come over and work in the mines. And, I think and, it's and sort that. of like, you know, in New York City, there's ethnic groups come over and then sort of like the Indians became the ones who owned all the gas stations. And the Chinese became all the ones who owned the laundries. And the Italians became the ones who owned the delis. You know, and they, ethnic groups do this. They send for their relatives. And that's what happened in Pueblo and Trin it was Pueblo and Trinidad and it was mining country, but then it became farm country and then it became hooch country. Yeah. And, Amazing, you know, right? Yeah. So that's and, how and, Uncle Charlie Carlino, the missing village people guy, <laughs> uh, ended up in the shootout. It was over, uh, it was part of the, uh, the uh, liquor, liquor wars. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, and even within the Italians, um, you know, I know that the Bades, you know, my grandfather, right. they were all icemen. For some strange reason, the Bades right. had the ice industry, you know. So my, my, my family had the hooch industry. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was probably a little bit more lucrative. Than right. Yeah, I think it was very lucrative. And my, my grandfather had this ranch. He, I, don't, I, I, I didn't think that he was involved in, in bootlegging because he had a cattle ranch. And my, my uncles used to ride the, the uh, what do you call it, when they go, cross country the cattle drives. Cattle, and yeah. then I found it. So I'm looking, 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 and I find out, oh, he was also, he was a rancher, he was a miner, he was an entrepreneur, and oh yes, he was an assassin. <laughs> <laughs> There's a record of him being an assassin, an FBI record, but they never got him on it. Wow, that's that's an incredible story. So now, so how did how did you did, I, I'm assuming your mom at some point came to New York, yeah. Yes, here was the story. The story always was that one of my aunts got, got married and moved to New York. And when she became pregnant, she was having a baby that she called for her mother because she was afraid of having a baby by herself because was, she was so young. And that my grandfather said, no, you're not going by yourself because then you'll be a Bhutana and you must 
now well, the whole family must come. And that's the story we always heard that he was protecting my grandmother's honor, sold the ranch and came. Well, I find out from another distant cousin, no, 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 he lost it in a poker hand. <laughs> <laughs> so this, this book is getting more interesting by the minute. Oh yeah, that's that's super interesting. Um, I'm, I'm not an author by any stretch of the imagination, but I'm trying to put together a book uh, specifically about, uh, you know, all the Italian families, uh, but geared, you know, a lot towards my, my grandmother's, you know, nobility side. And, I, you know, I'm just finding out some of the craziest things about some of these people, uh, you know, going back that, you know, my ninth great grandfather virtually owned the Campania, uh, wow. you know, in the 1600s. Uh, and then, you know, Who's stabbing who? Who's poisoning who? Who's yeah. sleeping with this one? Who's, whose daughter's getting married at 14? <laughs> you know, we, we have all these uh, whitewashed versions yes, of yes. our families, particularly if your family was nobility, you think, well, you know, they just stood around and, and you know, ate grapes and had parties and, but, you know, no, no, apparently, was, everybody apparently, was always poisoning everybody and stabbing yeah. everybody in the and, old days. And when they weren't doing that, they were they were fighting some war someplace over yeah. some you know hillside in you know in in, in uh, Italy. So I want to ask you, uh, you know, as you know, my dad was a daily news photographer for forty two right. years. That's uh, my my cousin Paul uh, was about ten years after my dad um, was a photographer for. Uh, gee, I think up until probably around the, the mid 90s or something like that. Um, so how did you get started with the Daily News? We'll be right back. Experience Italy like never before. Traveling with a scheduled group or create your own bespoke tour with friends with PhilItaly.com. Pack your bags and follow Phil. That's www.PhilItaly.co. Well, I was working as a columnist for New York Newsday and I got recruited to the Daily News in the mid nineties, I think it was. Yeah, so you probably just missed my cousin. Yeah. Because uh, he was, that's probably around when, when, just around when he retired. He may have been a little bit later than that. I mean, I think he's 83. And probably, we probably knew each other. But, you know. uh, in those probably, days, the newsroom had like 250 people. Now there's yeah. not even a newsroom anymore. I know, it's so sad. I. I used it's to love to like 40 people and then they just shut up the newsroom and said, you know, everybody just file from home. That's just not what I want to do. I don't, I have no, I mean, I write when I want to for them, but I don't want to be, I, I love the atmosphere and the, 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 the 24 seven adrenaline rush of the, of the news and being in the newsroom. And now everything is, you know, rewrite 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 that's not what i'm i mean the kids who are coming up in the news business don't even know how to do a stakeout anymore because they don't have to yeah. um because they're just rewriting somebody else and you know that's not that to me is not fun that's not fun that's just yeah. that's just and, black work. and i used to love going to the daily news building when my father so in, in the in so the 50s exciting. the late 50s you know early 60s and to your point going into that i've been in that newsroom and this right. is when they got, you know, it was smoke filled and the typewriters right. were going and, right. um, and, and my, um, I call him uncle Phil. He was actually my, my dad's cousin's husband. He was a photo editor at the daily news. Really? Uh, so, you know, we, that was like the most important job. It was New York's picture newspaper. That yeah. was the most important yeah. job was getting and, those pictures, not, not going to some service and picking up pictures. Everybody was out in the street, you know, to getting those pictures. It was um, yeah, and, time things. It was doing all that stuff. Those guys were heroes. And my, you know, my dad several times they wanted to make him a boss, and he didn't want it. He wanted to be on the street taking the right. taking the pictures. Uh, yeah, because if you're the boss, you're not you're not doing you're not in the action. Yeah. You're just yelling at everybody for not being in the action enough. <laughs> Uh, and, you know, one of my dad's, and you may have even seen it, um, one of my dad's f most famous pictures, I think, of his, um, and he's had pretty much everything, plane crashes, you know, Tony the Fruit Man hanging out of the car and all of that stuff. But there was a, um, in 1956, a, um, a father kidnapped uh, the baby 
And um, my dad got the call. He was working in Brooklyn, I think, at the time. And he took a picture of the mom, uh, very distraught and, and all of that. And the father was so moved by the photo in the Daily News that he called the paper and said, I'm going to bring the baby back. Oh, but wow. only, wow. only if the photographer who took the picture of my wife is there to take the picture with the baby. Oh my God. Wow. So at you the time, to... at the time, um, the, the news, the Times, the Journal American, all they all shared an office and you know, they were all right next door to each other. And they would all, you know, they'd all wind up going to these photo shoots at the same time and everything. Well, my dad had to sneak out because he, he couldn't tell them where he was going because right. he, this man wanted this exclusive. Right. Uh, and they were all asking him where, you know, where are you going and everything. And he, I don't know what story he made up, but he, you know, he made up some kind of story and, and, and got this uh, shot. But, you know, we were, you know, growing up, the, we, my, my brother and my sister and I, we were kind of like minor celebrities every time dad had the front page of the centerfold. Uh, and like you said, those pictures were made by New Yorkers in New York. You know, it's not the same anymore, like I said. No, I mean, everybody uses photo services. The Daily News, I don't know how many photographers they still have on staff, and I think they're probably freelance. I mean, there was a time when there were like 50, 60 That's more right. photographers. There were 250 people in the newsroom. And, you know, you know, my dad, you know, not to take anything away from photographers today, uh, and I'm a lousy photographer, <laughs> but, um, you know, my dad was walking around with a speed graphic with yeah, two sure. plates and, you know, flash bulbs and the shots that these guys would get. I mean, you look back at those photos, nothing compares to those black and white photos from back yeah, then. The Daily News halls in whatever office we were in, and there were three offices. The first was in a great Daily News building. Then there was one on, 40, on 34th and 10th. And now the last one was way down by Wall Street. Every one of those offices had the halls lined with photos from the very beginning to now. And some of them were just astounding, astounding. Most of them were very, were just astounding. Yeah, no, it, it's, it's an incredible. And um, for a while um, after the war, because all the photographers were coming back from World War II, my dad wanted to, be, he actually wanted to be a combat photographer in World War II. And they told him, um, you can't go right into being a combat photographer because only real photographers, right. he wasn't at that time, can do that. Uh, but they said, we'll put you in the signal corps. We'll, you know, we'll go through the photography and all of that. And the life expectancy for a combat photographer was six months. Oh my. So they said, you'll get your chance. Uh, but then they found out he had a punctured eardrum. Oh, that was that. <laughs> and he got kicked out of the army for that. <laughs> And so then he got into the daily news because there were no photographers. So he was uh, able to take pictures. But when they came back, then he was on, he was WPIX doing newsreels for, I don't know, five or six years or something like that. Uh, yeah. And I actually, this, this, you'll find this amazing. My wife and I, oh, I don't know, maybe 15 years ago, we were watching the um, Hilton story on TV. And um, I think it was the third or fourth episode, they showed Nikki Hilton, Hilton marrying Elizabeth Taylor. Uh, and they're on the boat and they pan the, the, the dock and there's my dad square in the middle with the movie camera. And it was just like this. And I said to my wife, that was my father. And she said, no, I can't. How do you know that? I said, I'm telling you, I know my dad. That was him standing there. And so I found it on YouTube and sure enough, there he was with the trench coat, you know, the typical <laughs> newsreel guy from back then. Um, I have an interesting, really interesting, bizarre photo story like that as well. When I was at the New York Post, I wrote a column on 9-12, the day, I mean, it ran 9-12 and I wrote it on 9-11. Um, and the photo that accompanied it, which they had no clue about, was my cousin, Frank Candiano, who was the Lieutenant Colonel who led all the troops into 9-11, into Ground Zero. 
And the photo that accompanied my column was my cousin leading the troops into ground zero. Isn't that wow. wild? We'll be right back. Lafayette, we are here. The French history podcast for the American public by a Frenchman. Learn all about France's fascinating history. It's great characters like Charlemagne, Joan of Arc, Louis XIV, or Napoleon. But also the great events that marked France, Europe, and sometimes the whole world. Lafayette, we are here. Available wherever you get your podcast or on lafayettepodcast.com. A bientôt. Wow. You know, sometimes you say it's a coincidence, but then you say, you know, maybe, maybe, it's, it's, maybe it's not. I mean, I, I find some things sometimes when I'm doing research that, you know, you're looking and looking and looking and waiting and waiting. And then all of a sudden something happens and out of the blue. Mm -hmm. And, you know, several people had told me that. And I kind of believe it. Um, you know, these ancestors want us to find them. So yes. sometimes okay. things, you know, gets planted. Uh, so I want to talk, uh, uh, you know, a little bit about your, your books for sure. Uh, I know you have a couple of fiction books. Uh, I believe they're fiction, the Book of Judas and yes. Six yes. Station. Yeah. Yes. What are the books about and where can people find them? And okay, The first one, The Six Station. Well, I write my novels the way I, because I'm a journalist. I mean, I spend years not just researching, but going to every place. So my husband and I took a, because we're insane, we took a 1400 mile road trip through Turkey. And one of the places we visited was the house of Mary. And now I had no idea that the Virgin Mary lived in Turkey, but apparently when Jesus was on the cross, he said to John, um, his, one of his apostles, she is your mother too, please take care of her. So John took her to Turkey where he thought she would be safe. And there's this little house that was excavated about a hundred years ago, maybe. And the walls are this thick. And the little peasant houses in Turkey back then, and, and you know, 2000 years ago, the wall, they don't exist anymore, but it was built like a little fort. And I started having visions after that about writing about a book and then it then it, I, I realized that I, I had this idea from there that <clears throat> they found the DNA of Jesus and they cloned Jesus would the same thing happen again now I am not religious by any means but this book was fed to me there's no doubt and um, required me five years through six countries um, I traveled with an exorcist priest from the Vatican and we traveled, we took a road trip through Italy until I found uh, the Vale of Veronica, the so-called Vale of Veronica. And it has, uh, which, which is little, in a little monastery, just sitting there. And they, gave, they let me take photos of it. And as I took wow. photos of it, it kept changing and changing and changing. And the 84 year old exorcist priest that I was with, I said, Father Jake, look at this. And I showed him how the pictures kept changing. And some of the pictures, the veil has got teeth and is growling and others he's smiling I said look at this and boom he faints dead away on the altar and I think wow oh god now I have I'm gonna have weekend at Bernie's I got an 84 year old <laughs> stiff I gotta drive back to Rome but the monks who said oh no he's fine I said he's laying there they said no no he's fine and they carried him to a cell and they let him sleep it off him and and they said let's go out to dinner <laughs> We went out to dinner and I walked and we came back. I opened the door. He's still there. As I said, he's sure he's not dead. They said, no, no, he's fine. And the next morning he woke up and he said he was just overcome by the energy. And that was it. And he was fine. And I, I stayed with the monks. I stayed with a crazy cloistered nun who studies this veil all the time. She's cloistered up in a, a mountain by herself. And she hadn't talked in 20 years and she was given permission to talk to me. And then I had to like, she was hanging on my car. I had to like keep hitting the door to get her off the car so I could get away. <laughs> I was escorted through France by a motorcycle gang when I got lost. I bet, and I climbed a mountain twice just to write that first book. Wow, that's incredible, and that's an amazing story about. That. So, how did you find this sexist priest? My husband knew him, believe it or not, from New York. He's a real character. He, uh, he owned a restaurant in New York and then he was sent to the Vatican. I don't know, it's all very mysterious. 
one time I went, we went to Italy and we always thought he was kind of just a, a pathological liar. And he said, come on, I'll take you to the, to the Vatican to see the Pope's place. And well, yeah, yeah, yeah. And we pull up and the, the what do they call the guards and the Vatican the guards? guards oh, yeah. yeah, they open the doors and we go in and, and I'm like taking pictures on the Pope's helicopter pad at this desk and all kinds of stuff. It was so crazy. He, so he was. So when I when I decided I had to find this veil and I found out where it was, I called him up and I said, hey, Father Jake, you want to take a road trip with me? So we road trip through about 200 miles there and back, stopping at crazy places and having him almost die on me. <laughs> but, you know, unlike a lot of novelists who can make up stories and, and do their research without going, I need to go to these places. I need to, I need to smell what it smells like. I need to know. And every time I go, I have another adventure that I would never have dreamed of that fits in the book. So yeah. Yeah. And that's why I was so stumped on my on this last book because I haven't been able to travel to Colorado. But now that I'm vaccinated, um, as soon as people are out and about, I'm going to Colorado to, to visit the place and see what's what, because I don't want to go there and not be able to talk to anybody. You know, yeah. COVID, yeah. I just don't want to. So as soon as that's as soon as that's all open up, that's my next trip. And that's why I was so disappointed that we didn't get to go last year, because that was part of my plan too, is actually going to some some of these places and, and seeing these some, some of these places. And um, you have to see them for yourself yeah. because there's nothing that a photo is ever going to tell you. Yeah, well, you one of one of my great grandfathers, ones. one of my great grandfathers is actually buried in uh, St. Peter's. What? Uh, Pope Paul the really? Third. Pope Paul the Third is one of my great grandfathers. Believe it or no. not. Yes. No. <laughs> I'll send you. I'll, I'll send you the uh, the link so you wow. can see my chart. Uh, yeah, I I just found these crazy crazy things. Um, well, and, I did the, I did the genealogy thing, and uh, on is it not not uh, twenty three and me, and the D I share the DNA with Marie Antoinette. <laughs> there you go. We have we have the family DNA, but who that? Yeah, I get to be with like the meanest woman that ever lived. <laughs> well, well, you know, the, the, oh, the most know, spoiled the, anyway. The, you know, the funny thing about this is, is you know, uh, there's millions of people who are related to these people. The trick is being able to find the connection. Right. Uh, and, and I was lucky um, that my grandmother brought, uh, I call it his calling card. It's about the size of an index, index card. And it says on there, um, his name, Nicola Piomalo, and in Italian, of course, it says from the Dukes of Capricota. Um, and my, my mom would always tell me that, you know, her father, you know, my grandmother's father was a Duke or a Count or something like that. Uh, and I kind of expected to maybe find a little something there. But like I said before, it was his wife that mm -hmm. had this amazing connection that has brought me back, back to, uh, 750 AD throughout all of Europe and, and all of that stuff. And so she was permitted to marry someone who wasn't of royal blood. Yes, probably Nobody because, was. you know, by that time there was no real nobility any, anymore. And they put, you know, probably had to marry off. But I'll tell you an interesting story about that. Um, my grandfather was in a seminary. I always, I had always heard the story that um, he would tell everybody that my grandmother would walk past and my grandmother was very, very beautiful. Walk past and flirt with him, walk past the window and flirt with him. Uh, I found out later from one of my second cousins um, that the real story was she was driving past the seminary in a fancy carriage one day and it broke down. I guess a wheel fell off, who knows? Um, and uh, he helped repair the carriage and they gave him a ride to wherever he was going to go. And that was it. He left the seminary. Uh, I also think that may be part of the reason why they, they came to America also. Yeah. Um, I mean, I know they had several children there. Uh, but my, you know, my gut feel is that she probably wasn't in the best graces of the entire family. Yeah. Um, because her grandfather was Prince, Prince Luigi Caracciolo. So he was a big deal 
and and I'm sure her marrying somebody that was not very interesting nobility uh, probably didn't sit sit very well about uh, about their meeting there's probably somewhere between the two stories is the actual the story truth. Yeah. Yeah, probably like everything probably. else maybe she arranged for the wheel to fall off because she was flirting yeah. with this guy who knows but and, that's, and, that's what i have discovered as a journalist somewhere between the person who calls you up with the tip and the truth is <laughs> some real story. i used to tell any any reporter who ever came to work for me don't come to me with a tip really because the tip is like the tip of an iceberg it's like this it's all shiny up here but the dirt is underneath it's been there for thousands of years. Dig that up and then tell me what the story is. Yeah, right, right. Um, and the interesting thing about my grandmother's parents is that um, they uh, were Piomalo and Crutchill. Their, his, his uncle and her aunt were married. So, you know, you start running these things through your head and you say, yeah. well, what probably happened was they were probably, and, and they were a little bit older. They were probably in their forties when they got married. Yeah. And you say, you know what? Maybe my great grandparents, maybe were at the wedding, they were at a party, they met, uh, because that's very unusual to have, you know, two people marry, you know, this person's niece and this person's nephew got married, you know, just like that. So you start thinking about those things. Um, so I want to ask you one more thing that I, I, I think is fascinating. You're involved with the Scotto cookbooks, yes? Scotto, yes. Scotto, yeah. Yeah, yeah I wrote their cookbooks. Um, they're friends, my, they've been my friends forever. So they were uh, very reluctant to ask, um, but they liked the, you know, they, so I said, absolutely. What are you kidding? I didn't write the recipes, but I wrote their family stories and Interestingly enough, I started adding my own family stories in there and they and to see if they'd notice and they didn't because their family stories are the same as my family <laughs> stories. Waking up on Sunday morning and you smelling the, the sauce being made and the meatballs frying and everything was the same, <laughs> was exactly the same. Uh, yeah, no, we all have that dip and well, get, getting the uh, getting the meatball before it was in the sauce, of course, grabbing that. No, no, uh, no. See, I never liked that. Oh, I love those. Yeah, I never liked it. My brother liked that. That was not for me. I had to have it cooked in the sauce before I would steal one. No, 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 no. I didn't like it just fried. <laughs> um, uh, but yeah, absolutely. All those. Yeah, we all have that same memory. Uh, I, I used to love. And you make um, an extra one for the dog. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, my, my grandmother's dog used to eat the pasta. Yeah. Um, too. Uh, and, um, you know, I used to love bringing the non-Italian friend over uh, to grandma's once in a while. And because they had no clue. You know, yeah. they didn't know about this. You start at one and finish right. at six. They, they thought that the first thing that came out was the meal. That was the meal. No. <laughs> you know, my mother used to have a big, when I was growing up, a big Lazy Susan on the dining room table. And it was always filled with candy and nuts and pretzels and chips. And since it was always there and we weren't forbidden, my brother and I really just ignored it all the time. My friends used to pile into my house and run like, like their pants were on fire to get to the lazy Susan because their parents didn't allow them to have all this stuff. <laughs> that's, that's funny. And we used to go to the beach with sausage and peppers, eggplant and parmesan, and you look at the blanket next to you and, you know, the American kids would be eating their peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. <laughs> <laughs> I remember one time, we had a family picnic at uh, Bethpage State Park. And I remember the whole family came. And But my mother always just called it macaroni and meatballs. So my uncle Tom Renda was, made, the, made the pasta. And my aunt said, come on, time for pasta. And I was like a little, little kid and I started crying. I said, I thought we were having macaroni. I didn't, <laughs> I didn't That's right. know it was called pasta. We used to call it macaroni. Macaroni, of course. Yeah, yeah. no, it's only... I, it's but the last 20 years you call it pasta. Yeah. You go to rest pasta. It's it's like, always what? what's that? Macaroni. <laughs> did you did you have gravy or sauce? Gravy. Yes, that's gravy. <laughs> of course. The gravy meat. Sunday gravy. <laughs> and where did I you go? I found where? out the difference. I found out the difference. It's called gravy because there's meat in it. That's right. Yeah. 
It's called sauce if there's not meat in it. But now we call everything sauce. Now but everything has to be sauce. throw in the brajol and the meatballs and whatever, you know, all that stuff. And where did you grow up? In Hicksville, Long Island. Oh, so you, so you started in Long Island. Yeah. Well, I was oh. born in Brooklyn. And oh, okay. I moved to Hicksville when I was like two. Something. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we're, we're all from uh, Corona originally. And then um, my parents... Uh, when Lemonized they first... King of Corona, the greatest yes, um, lemonades in the world. And Parkside. Well, we go have... to Parkside all the time. Oh, I miss the Parkside. The Parkside, Tony yeah. was... Of Tony. Uh, yeah, he was, he was best friends with my cousin, Lou, oh, okay. when they were growing up. Uh, and um, you know, the, do you know Lennon's Bakery? I don't know if you know, it's been no. gone a long, long time. Uh, they were the Manjapanis. They lived on the same, everybody lived on the same block, but um, the Lemon Ice King was, okay. um, you know, we used to get the big uh, five gallon thing when you know, we have the party right. at my grandmother's. Um, and for, for a while in the, in the during, when the World's Fair was on uh, until about, I guess the early eighties, my aunt and uncle had a luncheonette on 108th street. Uh, and I worked there for a couple of years. Um, and, um, yeah, I, you know, still remember those days when the, the, the vegetable guy would come around and the, um, the knife sharpening guy would come around. They all had their own trucks and all of that kind of stuff. But we, we grew up in, we were in Corona. My, I was born in Whitestone and then eventually we moved to College Point and that's kind My of- My husband, Sid Davidoff, was a Queens guy. You know, he was always born and raised in Queens. And, um, he set my daughter and I up, but good at, at the lemon ice king. Because we the first time we went, she said, Tell them you want a mix of lemon and something else. <laughs> so we said, Okay, we'll have the lemon and the tea. And they went for circus. Like, no mixing. There's no such thing as mixing. <laughs> and he's laughing. <laughs> no mixing. That's that's so funny. Yes, I know. Yeah, yeah. As soon as you said that, I as soon as you said set up, I said, uh oh. They have to mix. <laughs> but then my daughter, uh, one of the one of the kids who worked there fell in love with her because we used to go all the time. And he gave her the coveted real lemon ice king of Corona staff shirt. Oh, Not the I... one you buy, but the staff t shirt. <laughs> oh, that's nice. I, I my um I'll tell you about a uh, tough Tony's with uh when I was first dating my wife, I had a I had this neat little MGB. Oh, I had an Austin Healey 3000 was the right hand drive. Yeah, yeah. So we go to we go to the park side and I, I park by Spaghetti Park across the street there. There was, you know, they had the, the four space parking lot or something. Right. So I park across the street. I leave the top down. It was summertime and we're getting out. And my wife says to me, you're going to leave the car like that? Aren't you going to put the top up and set the alarm and everything? I said, no. I said, no, I'm not <laughs> here. <laughs> not, not here. So she says, well, how do you know? And I said, watch. So as we're walking in the door, the guy's standing out front. And I said, is, is uh, that MGB safe over there? Ain't nobody going to touch that car. Yeah, right. <laughs> she goes, how did you know that? I said, trust me, nobody's you touching remember that Remember they car. used to have a... Um, her, um, on the other side of the street from Parkside, they had that little coffee place that never had coffee. I don't know what went on in there. I tried, we tried a hundred times to get a cup of coffee. We don't have any coffee, <laughs> <laughs> but it's a coffee, but we don't have coffee. <laughs> okay then. <laughs> well, I'll tell you one last Corona story before we go. And that was, uh, I've told this a couple of times on these interviews, but my Aunt Mary um, and my Uncle Tom, and my uncle Frank both worked at Leonard's Bakery. Uh, and I just found this out recently, the owner, Leonard, uh, Leonard Mon Mangiapane, was cousins with uh, Profaci. Oh. So my aunt's behind the counter. This is probably <laughs> late 50s, maybe early 60s or something like that. And Profaci walks in uh, with his two sons and he's wearing a white fedora and as he goes past my aunt mary says says there goes charlie chan and his two sons and they go past and he gives a look and the boys kind of chuckle they're in the back doing whatever business they're doing olive oil business i guess um and as they come out 
he says to my aunt in Sicilian, you're a real wise one. And she said the two sons, were, they were hysterical, right? <laughs> and they, they leave. So her boss comes running out and he's going, Mary, Mary, what are you doing? Don't you know who that is? She goes, yeah, Pafachi, the olive oil man. And he's like, he's the olive oil man, but he's not the olive oil man. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, uh, you know, Leonard's had a, had a, they were a great bakery, but I think they had a side business too at the time. I, uh, I'm the only Italian on earth that doesn't like Italian pastry. How could that be? I don't know. It's gift a generation. My <laughs> grandsons make me take them to, to uh, um, Little Italy for uh, the uh, cannoli king. We go to the cannoli king and they, get, and they just stuff their faces with it. I just, I don't like Italian pastry. Never well, have. Well, this has been delightful and fascinating. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Uh, so I can't tell you how much I enjoyed this. This has really, really been a lot of fun. Thank you. It was a lot of fun for me too.